a hypothetical asteroid encounter, Marshall's 21st century planetary defense to the rescue. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Brent Barbie, aerospace engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Welcome, Brent. Hi, Tanya. So give us a brief summary of your background, especially as it relates to the study of near-Earth objects. Sure. Um, so I did my uh, university studies at the University of Texas at Austin um, for both undergraduate and graduate. And, um, and in both my undergrad and my graduate work, I elected to study the, the problem of planetary defense versus um, hazardous near-Earth objects. So I've been, I've been studying that problem for quite some time. You've recently played a role at the 2019 International Academy of Astronautics conference where you and some other experts uh, from around the globe discussed a hypothetical Armageddon movie scenario. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, in fact, the scenario is still going on today. So I'm going to be providing another set of updates um, probably in about an hour from now uh, for the scenario. Um, so what we do is we design these hypothetical asteroid threat exercises where we create um, a fictitious asteroid and put it on a fictitious orbit around the sun. We choose the parameters of the orbit um, to make it realistic, uh, representative of objects we, that we've already discovered and cataloged but also to make it very challenging, make, put it on orbit that's difficult to observe and difficult to send spacecraft to, um, to provide a stressing case, to, to test our capabilities, of course, all in simulation. Um, and so we have this object, it's uh, in the scenario, it's discovered in March of, of the current year 2019. And um, after discovery, uh, there's a possibility that the asteroid might impact us in uh, April of 2027, eight years later. And of course, we have to talk about impact probabilities because our measurements of the asteroid's orbit are, they have noise and bias, uh, as all measurements do. And so um, our, our, we only have an estimate of the asteroid's orbit around the sun. It's got uncertainty associated with it. And so it's, it's not certain that the asteroid is going to hit us. But within a few months of the asteroid being discovered, the probability has reached kind of an alarming level, around the 10% level um, during the summer of 2019. And that sets the stage for the exercise. Once the impact probability reaches about 10% by international agreement, that's when um, mission development to, to at least at a minimum send a reconnaissance ship to the asteroid would start. How is this hypothetical case study going so far? Are you learning anything yet? Yes. Um, so this, we've, we've, uh, <laughs> we've learned a lot about uh, just how challenging it is to, or how challenging it would be to stand up a campaign of missions against a, an object like this. It's on a very large orbit around the sun, so it's a long orbital period. Uh, so it's very eccentric orbit and very inclined, very tilted relative to the Earth's orbit plane. And that really constrains um, our, our options and available launch dates. And so one of the things that's, that's very apparent from the scenario is that if we don't have um, good procedures in place for getting uh, spacecraft off the ground quickly, whatever that architecture might look like, uh, that really limits our response capabilities. Um, and of course, also, uh, the further in advance we discover the asteroids, uh, the more options we have, because we have a lot more time to act, um, a lot more launch opportunities that we can take advantage of. You know, keeping in mind those launch opportunities are driven by the, the orbital physics. Um, and so it's reinforcing points that have already been discussed in the community, which include the need for an infrared space-based uh, survey telescope. NASA is currently um, pursuing the development of such a telescope called NEOCAM. And that system would afford us um, a much, much, more, um, much more rapid completion of our efforts to catalog the asteroids. And as well, it would give us more warning um, if, if there's hazardous ones on the way. So early detection is, is key. Um, but as well, um, we want to be prepared to respond quickly because we can never rule out the possibility of some object that's just on a really tough orbit to, to track that we just don't have a whole lot of warning time for. So uh, we want to develop systems and procedures that allow us to get a reconnaissance spacecraft off the ground quickly. Why, why an infrared scope? Well, because um, asteroids don't emit any visible light of their own. So the only way we can see them with a... Uh, um, visible band telescope is, is through the sunlight that bounces off the asteroids and into our telescopes. Um, however, the asteroids are also absorbing thermal energy from the sun and then re-radiating it as, as 
thermal photons. And because they're, uh, the, the, those thermal emissions come from all over the asteroid's body kind of uniformly, um, when we see them in the infrared, we get a much better estimate of how large they actually are. I mean, if we, don't, if we see them in the visible band, all we know is how bright they are. We don't know how, how shiny or dull the asteroid surface is. But in the infrared, you know, the, the amount of um, uh, light, infrared light coming off the asteroid, if you will, is uh, directly proportionate to, to what the actual diameter of the asteroid is. Um, and as well, asteroids are very bright in the infrared relative to the background of space. So that means that a telescope that's looking um, deep in the infrared uh, is, is a lot more sensitive to uh, the asteroids than an equally sized telescope looking in the visible band. And so that means that you can get good performance with a smaller mirror for the telescope, and that reduces the size, cost, and complexity of the telescope. Tell us about Apophis 2029 and why April 13, 2029 will be exceptional. Well, that will truly be an exceptional day because it will mark a historic close approach. Um, it'll be the closest approach um, that we're aware of uh, in, in any sort of modern, modern time frame of an asteroid of that size passing that close to the Earth. So Apophis is probably about 350 meters in size based on our remote observations of it over the years. It was discovered in 2004, so we've had a number of opportunities to track and observe it. Um, and on April 13th, 2029, April 13th is actually a Friday, so April the 13th, Friday the 13th in April 2029, the asteroid is going to pass within about 30,000 kilometers or so of the Earth's surface, which is uh, below the altitude of our geosynchronous um, satellites. So it's gonna be a really close pass. It'll probably reach about third magnitude in terms of its brightness in the sky, uh, meaning that it will be naked eye visible um, and because of the timing of the close approach, you'll have to be uh, somewhere in Europe or maybe Africa to be able to see it in the night sky. So talking about possibly being able to see it, if we all want to maybe go to Africa to, to try to get a view, what, what might we see? What, what might it look like as it speeds by? Well, it would look kind of like a, um, a star that, that probably isn't, um, you know, maybe not twinkling the way that, a, that an actual star would necessarily. Um, and it'll be moving across the sky fairly, fairly quickly. Um, not zooming across the sky, but moving across at a pretty steady pace. Um, if you've ever looked up in the night sky and watched, um, uh, looked, you know, you gotta go to a dark, you know, dark area with very little light pollution. Um, but if you look at the night sky, periodically you'll see, you know, kind of faint but visible objects kind of moving really, really steadily across the sky in a very smooth motion. And those are our satellites in Earth orbit. Uh, moving across the sky. And uh, uh, it'll probably look something like that, but probably moving a bit faster than they do, I would suppose. How might Apophis change or be changed as a result of its proximity towards Earth? That's a great question. Um, so Apophis is going to get close enough to the Earth that it'll be well within, um, well within range of, of the Earth's gravitational field, so to speak. And, and that could possibly uh, change the the way that the asteroid is rotating. Most asteroids are rotating in some form or fashion. Um, and between that and the, the gradient across the object in terms of um, you know, parts of it that are closer to the Earth experiencing more of a pull than the parts of the asteroid's body that are further away, uh, in combination with um, changes to its rotational state, depending on how strong the body is or how not strong it is, could um, change its, its morphology, could change its shape and, and cause material in the asteroid to shift around. Um, uh, based on the, the literature I've seen, because that, that's not actually the area that I personally do modeling of, but based on, on what, I've, what I've seen and been told, I don't recall that uh, there's, a, there's much anticipation that the asteroid will be broken apart or disrupted, um, but it could undergo some changes and it would be interesting to see what happens. Um, you may recall that in the mid-1990s when Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 struck Jupiter, it was torn into a number of fragments, of, you know, 20-some fragments as I recall, um, before it actually, before those fragments collided with Jupiter. Um, but uh, we're not thinking at this point that Apophis is going to be torn into a bunch of pieces. Apophis isn't the only object that will visit our neighborhood. The end of the next decade is going to feature several visitors, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it, it's worth pointing out that objects pass relatively close to Earth 
pretty frequently. I mean, we, we get hit routinely by objects the size of cars or, you know, something like that. And, and they explode way up high in the upper atmosphere, um, usually with several kilotons worth of energy, maybe a few, kilot a few tens of kilotons worth of energy. And of course, we get hit by even smaller things the size of pebbles and soccer balls, uh, even more often than that. Uh, because, of course, the, the population follows a power law. So there's exponentially more of the smaller objects than there are the larger objects. So probabilistically, we're, well, we're always more likely to be struck by small stuff. And sure enough, that's exactly what we observe. Um, but every so often, a, a larger one will pass close. So sometimes things that are kind of like the size of a, of a big bus or an air, you know, a, a, a house or something like that, um, every you know, couple of few times a month will pass closer to us than our moon um, on average. And then less frequently than that, we'll get buzzed by something that's even bigger. Um, so sometimes, sometime towards the, the latter part of uh, the 2020s, um, I, as I recall, some, it's, it's about a 900 some meter object is gonna pass about half the distance between us and the moon at some point. So that's even bigger than Apophis, but of course it'll be quite a bit further away maybe more on the order of about, you know, 190 to 200,000 kilometers away, as opposed to Apophis' 30,000. What are some of the other big takeaways and, and maybe even what's left for the 2019 conference this week? So today we're gonna to feature um, some, um, the, the second to last set of updates for our hypothetical threat exercise, um, which will, uh, you know, today we'll be covering the aftermath of our, simulated attempts to deflect the incoming hazardous asteroid and we'll find out today what happens i can't reveal that yet can't spoil the surprise um, and then and then we'll set the stage for what comes next um, and the final stages of the exercise we played out um, tomorrow at the conference um, tomorrow friday may 3rd is the final day um, and uh, as, even as we speak there are a number of excellent technical uh, presentations that are um, taking place that'll wrap up soon um, and for those who were not able to attend in person or tune in remotely, the video recordings of all of the conference presentations will, are available online. Um, usually the one day's material will be posted in full by the following day. Um, and as well, we plan to host uh, all of the presentation materials, all the presentation files on the IAA conference website, which is easily located with the Google search. All right, Brent. I just so our audience knows that wasn't an actual asteroid that was uh, potentially blew up behind you. That was a thundercloud, right? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Brent Barbie, aerospace engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about the conference or the simulation. How can they do that? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, the easiest way to reach me is by e email. Uh, it's uh, brent.w.barbie at nasa.gov. Thanks again. And if you guys want to find me and more of my interviews, you can go to tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.